Um, I'm here with Flavia Agnes. She is a women's rights lawyer and writer from Mumbai, India. She's in town for a Seeking Social Justice in South Asia conference, and we have the pleasure of interviewing her again for the Global Feminisms Project after her interview in 2003 in India. So um, I wanted to kind of reflect on the time that has passed between the interviews, and I was thinking about starting with political context, but as the personal is political, maybe you can talk about your personal journey since 2003 and what has changed for you in your life personally, in your life professionally, um, with Matlis, anything. Well, uh, I think our organization, Matlis, has really done well mm -hmm. in these years. Our legal center has consolidated over the years. I think in 2003, we had politically, we had the right wing BJP government. After that, the Congress government came to power for 10 years, 2004 to 14. And the issue that I had raised in my early interview were like subsided um, because I think when I did the interview in 2003, the 2002 Ujrat riots had just happened, a lot of turmoil. But 2004 to 14 were the years when the Congress-led coalition was in power. Mm, these issues of minority rights did not come up. 2014, uh, the same chief minister who was the who who was the chief minister of Gujarat when the riots happened became the prime minister. So the 2014 to 2017 have been more uh, turbulent years for minorities and my, since our organization apart from working on gender we also work on minority rights uh, and main, various other NGOs working on minority rights mm. uh, are pushed to the back and there's a lot of funding constraint surveillance a lot of things happen have happened but on the front of gender and women's rights uh, our organization has done well in terms of uh, litigating for women and getting justice. So that's going on. But uh, another thing that has happened for me personally is that my organizational responsibilities have come down. Mm. So I have more time to write. So I have more mm. time to look at issues that the organization is doing and then like put them in a more public sphere to like have articles, have discussions, etc. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, there's a lot more avenue today in social media, apart from formal publications, uh, to engage with issues. So that's also happened. That's a new thing since 2003 to 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how do you see your writing impacting the legal work and legal framework within India? Do you see that impact? Yeah, I see a lot of it uh, that when I write, now we have also a social media uh, networks to circulate those articles. Mm -hmm. So I see they're going to many and people in turn uh, putting them on their Facebook mm -hmm. and on their networks. So the power of the social media today is immense. Mm -hmm. So you, it, the articles reach to people who are engaged with it. Mm -hmm. Earlier when you write in an academic journal, when you publish a book, you didn't know like people are actually reading it. Is it making a difference? But today you can see a lot more engagement with those writings. Mm -hmm. Do you see that engagement turning over into the communities that are seeking the support? Or do you see it happening in the people affecting the policy? Or is it just the ground level? It is affecting the people who are like in a particular social milieu. Mm -hmm. uh, academicians, mm -hmm. activists, mm -hmm. more urban, more English speaking at a particular level. Uh, and there you can see a lot of churning happening, mm -hmm. a lot of grouping happening, uh, a lot of intersectionality happening. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it spills on to the policy level as well. Yeah. But on the ground level, I do not know how much it is going to people mm -hmm. who actually need this. Sure. And but the individual women are getting benefited by it. Are they getting uh, access to justice mm -hmm. in their lives? Mm -hmm. Because we also have lots of things have changed today, where the government has receded its responsibility in the public sphere. It's become more like privatized mm -hmm. and globalized. 
and um, government is only doing more of surveillance. So the poor and the marginalized are like pushed to the wall. And one level we have a lot of affluence that is happening and one level the poverty levels have really increased mm -hmm. and there's a wide disparity. So whether we reach and most of them are like rural, small towns, even in urban cities, uh, women from the poorer classes, I don't think we're reaching out to them. Mm -hmm. But Majlis does training and advocacy and education work. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? Did it always start with outreach like that? Or how did it start and how has it grown? We always had this, like, you know, for me, uh, uh, since Madhuri started, now we are like 25, 26 years old. We started in 1991, we mm -hmm. registered. Our work started in 1990. And I have been there, like, continuously. And for me, one of the important things about law was demystifying law. Mm. Make it more simple, make it more reachable, making it reach to the women who actually need it and to the NGOs working on the ground. So I had I have written a lot on like informal small booklets, publications, um, workshops, uh, legal literacy camps, a lot of that was happening in 1990 to 95, 96. In between, I think we concentrated more on working with lawyers. Mm. Um, making lawyers understand what the law is, making lawyers into feminist lawyers, into a district level, um, reaching out mm. networks. Uh, we had a project of uh, uh, engaging uh, rural women lawyers into the feminist discourse. Mm. We had it a long time ago. And in that period, I think uh, we did less of advocacy and um, reaching out to NGOs at, at the ground level here in Mumbai. But um, again, we've gone back to like going out much more uh, like legal advocacy at the doorstep, uh, reaching out to NGOs, going there, uh, reaching out to schools, reaching out to colleges in a very big way mm -hmm. because that's where the youth is and, and this, mm -hmm. they understand what their rights are mm -hmm. because we have a lot of domestic violence, we have a lot of sexual abuse, mm -hmm. we have a lot of violence in the workplace. So now we have a lot of laws in place to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But access to justice is where we are really suffering. And there is a blockage in people's mind, women's mind, that they're afraid of courts, they're afraid of the police, mm -hmm. and they're afraid of the law, and they're afraid of lawyers. Mm -hmm. And though you know that, okay, I have a right under the Domestic Violence Act, I should not be beaten. I have a right. I should not be sexually abused. But you don't know where to do, where to go, what to do, and whether when you take that step, what will be the logical end of it? How long it will take? How expensive is it? Uh, and what is going to happen to you as the victim there? Are you going to get justice in the system? So these are the fears that people have, and Matlis engages a lot in teaching people strategies. Mm. I because I feel this legal strategies of the pre-litigation time are very very important in order to get so-called justice. Justice doesn't happen out of the blue. You have to prepare yourself. You have to get the documents in place. You have to have a proper um, statement uh, which does not have contradictions, which captures you actually what you are going to say. It should not be like a mechanical statement, etc. And so now what we have done. Is because in Madlis, not everybody is a lawyer. We have a team of about 25 people, but it is there's admin staff, the lawyers, and there are social activists, social workers, and you cannot make out a difference between the two that who's a lawyer and who's a social worker. We want to bridge that gap and make the law accessible to lawyers, non lawyers alike. Mm -hmm. A lot of work that we do for victims of sexual abuse is a support work. Mm. that walking the journey with the victim from the time the FIR, the first information is recorded mm. by the police. Then there are so many steps that the victim actually goes through till she comes to the court for the trial, which may be a year later, which may be two years later. And she might be a young, illiterate girl. She might be a school dropout. She might be uh, not, and she may, maybe the person is a family member, somebody close to her. There's a lot of pressure in the family, in the community. How do you help this girl to walk this journey and see that the she is not victimized by the system. Mm -hmm. 
see that her dignity and her integrity is protected into this when she walks through this journey and to see where there are lapses where the police lapses on the police side lapses on the prosecution side lapses on the part of the judge you like make them visible mm. and i think through this uh, we've done a lot of work and this work now we want to our work with domestic violence and sexual violence victim we want to take the, take it to the ngos ngos working on the ground and they also have social workers they also have and they're much more closer to the victim so they understand when violations happen so we have right now adopted like five very very local angels working on the ground mm-hmm. when we ask them to give us like two or three social workers mm-hmm. and our social workers and lawyers work with them mm-hmm. about the cases that come up from their organization rather than just making a reference to us and then they don't have responsibility and we have told them that we you must work the journey with us and the victim mm-hmm. and that's how we will learn the system so mm-hmm. this is a new project that we have started and let's see what impact it has well, that's great In your autobiography you wrote about mutual support centers, right? And um I think that a lot of these movements start as just support, right? <coughs> Connecting with one another as as women as survivors. Um can you talk a little bit more about how Madlas has grown to be reaching out to communities um and reaching out to NGOs and was there anything lost like did it start as a community group smaller and is now as it's grown been able to reach out to those small community groups and has anything been lost actually um what we started uh, i mean there's a long time ago in 1980 when i came out it was like a small mutual support group of a particular class within this class structure mm-hmm. urban class structure and we were able to support each other it's been a long journey after that uh, after that i um, finished my graduation i did my law i became a lawyer and one of the important areas i felt is that you may get social support of a lot of women groups supporting each other but by the time you enter the legal domain you have to go to a proper professional lawyer mm. so i wanted to be there like you know that get that professional uh, degree so that you are, are you understand you have insights mm. you understand the law you understand the women who want to come but unless you have a professional degree you cannot enter the space of the court arena so uh, from there i moved and when by the time madli started the whole uh, idea was to be much more a professional uh, domain where a team of women lawyers help victims women victims mm. and that's a very like a new model mm. and nobody else was doing that mm-hmm. and uh, i mean human rights itself was on the side as compared to corporate law and the mainstream law or criminal law or constitutional law and then you have in the side human rights mm-hmm. but into the human rights women's rights were like pushed to the wall and nobody really was doing women's rights at that time to make women's rights acceptable to put it on the mainstream that had been a struggle at the time but over the period many things politically happened globally happened so women's rights became in the forefront uh, in every sphere rape domestic violence laws campaigning etc and they were more in the campaign side but we were on the implementing side mm. always on the implementing side like we think less of what the law should be how the law should, you know like we want it is this is not there that's not there something more has we need to give rights to women and our thing was okay let's look at what is there and let's see how well we can reach out and implement that mm-hmm. so that's been our major focus and has continued to be so and a lot of young lawyers are getting attracted to this idea they come they work with us for some time they intern with us from various law colleges in india uh, outside and young lawyers working with us our problem is of working with young lawyers has its own limitations mm. because uh, for women the lots of phases in life where they have to migrate they're not able to work they get married or they get have children and and so the organization always has uh, like very good very committed uh, lawyers 
then dropping out for these reasons and then you're all the time reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. But we have not compromised on the all women team because we think that's a major ideology mm -hmm. that we have to commit ourselves to. Uh, though we're entering the legal space, we're le entering the, from the space of women's experiences. Mm -hmm. But um, today, this space and this world gets more recognition. Mm -hmm. It's not like pushed to the background as I told you when we started. And recently we got a very prestigious award for being an all women team because they were looking at gender sensitivity. It was, it's the award is called Martha Farrell Award. Mm -hmm. And uh, this woman was committed to gender, uh, gender politics, had worked a lot in creating sensitive gender spaces. And then she was killed when she went to Afghanistan for the, on a UN job. Mm -hmm. And then they set up this award. And this was the first year of that award. Mm -hmm. And there were like a lot of organizations were there. And then the fact that we have this particular space for women who work in the organization and mm -hmm. for that we got the award. So now we can see that this gets much more recognition. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's beautiful that it's comprised of women because the focus um, and your tagline was transforming victims into survivors, right? So can you talk a little bit more about your experience in that transformation? And also, it doesn't seem like it necessarily stops there, or maybe it does, or maybe the role of survivor entails becoming a role model, but you've gone so beyond um, becoming an agent of change in your community, in your country and world. Um, so what does that transition look like from victim to survivor to agent of change or? You know what happened at some point around a few years ago, um, about say four or five years ago, we started calling all victim survivors. Mm -hmm. It was fashionable to do that, it was feminist to do that. So the minute a rape happened, gang rape has happened and we call her a survivor. Mm -hmm. But then we had this major case of a, this woman who was raped and brutally attacked on the bus, in a moving bus in Delhi in 2012. And we can't call her a survivor because she died. Mm -hmm. She died a victim. Mm -hmm. But there are many who are victims and continue to be victims. Um, they retract in the court, they go back to the same situation. There's a, a lot of victimhood that happens even after you report a case, when, even when the case is reported uh, by the police, by health of, uh, officials, etc. You may be having a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old who's raped by members of her family. She doesn't even know that she's abused. She goes to the hospital for something and then you um, to find out that she's pregnant, like mm -hmm. five months, six months, seven months pregnant, and she was not even aware of it. So then a rape, ca a rape case is recorded, and then you call her a survivor. And then she's with a pregnancy, she's 14, she's 13, she comes from a poor background, she has to deliver this child, she has to give this child an adoption, the whole process that goes on apart from the legal process. How can you call her a survivor? She's a victim of this entire thing of patriarchy, of neglect, of family violence. She's like, she is a victim of all these things. So what we say, she can become a survivor, but it is a process. It is a process that the legal system itself should not re-victimize her. She, this process should be an empowering mission for her. Mm -hmm. That while she walks through this, she finds how the system works. She's able to give evidence in court very coherently. Mm -hmm. She's able to uh, uh, go back to school while she was a dropout before. Uh, she has a safe shelter or a place to stay. Her education continues, skill development happens. It's a very long process. Maybe it takes, uh, the legal case may take about a year and uh, or two, but the the coming out of this victim or to become a survivor, to be able to support herself and others, uh, maybe will take like at least three to four years for her to stand on her own feet and to say, yes, I was raped, but I have come out of it or I was a victim of domestic violence, but now I am here. Even for me, like when I came out in 80, it took a long time as I put in my autobiography, there's so much of back and forth that happened. There's so much of support from other feminists that you take in order to move forward. Otherwise, you would have gone back again and again. So I seriously believe that this transition is a process. 
and NGOs working on the ground, one of your major responsibility becomes that hand holding. That you know, here's this victim who remains a victim, but I have to hold a hand and I have to take her through the system that tomorrow she will become a survivor. Then only I can use the word survivor for that victim. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of changing the nomenclature. Mm -hmm. Just as one fine day I say, oh, she's a survivor. You don't even know. She, you don't, not even you don't care. You don't even know. You don't even care. Mm -hmm. You're a journalist. You're writing and you use the word survivor. You don't know what situation she is. Like many of our victims, after the case is registered, uh, attempt to commit suicide three or four times. Mm -hmm. You're not aware. You've got a story and you have a, a nomenclature that, okay, this survivor and this is the story and sensation writing. And at the, after that, then what? So this is our challenge. So this, uh, that's a tagline to change victims into survivors. Mm -hmm. So as a survivor yourself, right, of domestic violence, um, what caused you to move forward and advocate for other women? Well, I came out of an exciting time in the women's movement that, um, that was very, very exciting and mutually supporting time. And my friends were not battered or they had not abused, experienced abuse. But the fact that I was going through that and when I spoke to them, they, were, they came out very willingly to support me mm -hmm. in many different ways. I had small children, I had no money, I needed a job, I needed, hundred, I needed a place to stay, I needed a hundred different things. And if that support was not there, I would never have become a survivor. So what I realized is that support at that particular juncture is very important mm -hmm. for any victim. It's, 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 it is what is what is there between a suicide and a survivor. Mm -hmm. That is the choice that women have. They want to come out. If the family doesn't support, if people do not support, where will you be? So uh, she goes back and she commits suicide because she thinks there's nothing else working for her. You may have the best of laws. So here, that's what we think. But we are not the first support. And we don't do direct, usually. We work through an NGO because the support has to be grounded. Mm -hmm. Somebody finds her, some work that's going on. It might be on nutrition, it might be on shelter, it might be on any of the other issues, literacy. And then you find a woman who is battered. And then you locate her in her own surroundings and say she's part of your program, she's part of everything else. But she also has a problem with her husband and she's like abused, sexually abused, domestic violence. Then they should be able to pick her up and tell her, counsel her, do whatever is necessary, prepare her mentally and then bring her to us. And then we do the next step of like counseling her, explaining to her her rights and then making her ready to go through the legal journey. So that connections become very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know whether there are programs like this here, but this is how, because we don't have social support, we don't have state support. So it has to be from the community or the family and through NGOs that you have to build the support into right. it. Yeah, where has your support come from over the years? And has it been domestic, it's only community? Have you received any overseas support? Uh, we get a funding from the overseas uh, for the organization. For me personally, I had some very good friends who had supported me immensely and unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Like not only shelter, not, even, not just uh, have faith in me, but also gave a direction that education is very important. This particular friend, her name is Sonal Shukla, now she's like old. And she has been a very strong support, an anchor for me, uh, who explained that how important education is because I was like just school level educated. That, you know, and she gave me such immense support to graduate. And then once you've done that, then the law and all, everything falls in place and it becomes easier. And the law became important because I was, we had set up a mutual support center called Women's Center. And there all the time we had to refer women to lawyers outside who did not have the framework that we did. So that's why I started doing my law. By the time I finished my law, I was out of that group. That group itself had over the years collapsed. But then setting up of Majlis with a very strong uh, approach to professional lawyering. So earlier we had only lawyers working with us. And everybody else is to think that people with social work background or any other experience cannot work in Matlis. 
Then we put out a very strong message that anybody can work in the organization. Where there's community work to do, there's writing work to do, there is uh, reports, um, funding, there's lots of things that an NGO has to do apart from just lawyering. So now we are like more rounded in our approach mm -hmm. and working with the communities. Great, thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we talk about your work with intersectional feminism um, and kind of open the floor. You opened your talk on Saturday or Friday with a really powerful sentiment. Um, maybe you could dive into that a little bit more and then we can go from there. Yeah, here we, when we talk about intersectionality, what we're talking about where the Muslim women's rights are there in the forefront. And we had a case in 1985, which is the like a watershed, it's called uh, Shabanu case. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of political activity on both sides, uh, whether uh, the one side is Muslim fundamentalist, other side is feminist and human rights activist, and they're like pol poles apart. And, and the government and, and the law was that under secular law, this woman would get maintenance. And there was a whole political mobilization from the Muslim fundamentalist side. And a new law was enacted in 1986. And that's called the Muslim Women's Act. And all of us felt at the time that, you know, all these personal laws in different communities should not be there. We should have a uniform civil code. This was in 1986. 1992, the right wing political mobilization and anti-Muslim agenda started coming into the forefront. And it, it was happening from 90s onwards. But the major thing that happened in 92 was the demolition of the 400 year old mosque in a place called Ayodhya because it was believed that there was a mandir of the god Ram. Mm. And so this has to be destroyed and that mandir must be built. So there was a big political campaign. The case was going on in the court and they filed an affidavit that, you know, allow us to do some puja here, but we will not destroy the mandir. Uh, after that affidavit, they destroyed the mandir. Mm. And uh, it was uh, like a acquiescence from the government, uh, from the state government, from the central government, and it led to ri riots countrywide. And the riots were like, the Muslims agitated and the police opened fire. Um, and Mumbai, where, the Bombay where I stay, it did not have um, uh, communal rights, even when the country partitioned. It was supposed to be secular. Mm -hmm. It had a working culture. It was supposed to be progressive. And the rights broke out in the city of Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And it came as a shock to us. Mm -hmm. We had a labor movement. We had feminist movement. We had progressive movements of all sides. I said, how can this happen? I suddenly you realize all these movements, secularism was never the main issue that we looked at, even within feminism. It was gender, it was all women are same. And that was for me the turning point because um, for the relief work, we worked with the same group whom we had labeled as fundamentalist. Mm. Uh, because there was nobody else doing the work. And the women were sheltered in uh, the mosques, the dargahs, uh, some, we met women whose fingers were cut, we, very kinds of women whose houses had burned, whose sons had been killed. And the riots came in two waves. One was a week-long riot in December, and again it erupted in January, mm. which was much more fierce. Mm. And we had a Congress government ruling, but it was the right-wing government, the right-wing political parties, and the police colluding, government looking the other way, and you could really see how it actually works. And there was a committee that was set up, a um, commission that was set up. One was a formal commission, one was an informal commission. Now, all the secular and human rights groups also worked with Muslim groups. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we wrote a paper, which I will share with you, that you know, somehow the women's movement has to redefine its agenda and bring secularism in the context because this is the need of the hour. Because uh, my issue is that the Muslim woman who's there in, the sh in that shelter, in that dargah taking uh, records, she cannot be divided as this is gender and that is um, identity. The gender and identity both come together. Like she's being beaten by her husband, 
but her son has been killed by the police. Both are very important issues. The house is burned. These are all her concerns. And when uh, her son is uh, killed or a house is burnt, she will put the domestic violence on the back ground because she will not go to the police and complain because immediately her husband will be arrested mm -hmm. and she doesn't want that to happen like suppose a Muslim woman a Hindu woman goes and complains of domestic violence police will say no this is okay this is you should go back but if, if a Muslim woman goes and uh, complains immediately he will be arrested and any kind of charges can be le le levied against him so now the issue of domestic violence becomes much more complex for the Muslim woman and we have to understand that complexity and we have to reach out to her beyond that complexity mm -hmm. and then by the time we had already got our organization registered as Majlis and Majlis is a Urdu name so people started confusing us of being Muslim or Muslim means terrorism and because bomb blast had happened all these things had happened that is my political awakening about identity politics and that the need to put gender within identity politics and we cannot have a okay this is where I am working on gender but this is where I am talking on identity the same groups going here and there but the woman is the same with two different political agendas so how do you like have a more nuanced understanding this was 1994 I published this article and after that we looked at all the laws including the new act that came which is Muslim women's act after Shabanu mm -hmm. and suddenly you realize that courts are giving rights to Muslim women and their lump sum settlements you Muslim women can avail of and nobody is talking about it. So various high courts you can see these judgments happening. So we started working very much on that saying that uh, countering the view that Muslim women have no rights unless a uniform civil court happens that Muslim women do have rights mm -hmm. similar to Hindu women having rights and we should make these rights happen. But my struggle has been 94, 95 uh, to now 20 years but the same notion continues in the women's movement even today mm -hmm. that uh, very very few people in fact Farina asked me that why don't more people write about this. There are some Islamic scholars, Muslim women scholars who attempt to write but somewhere they I think get pushed back uh, um, how to put community and gender concerns together mm -hmm. look at Hindu law and Muslim law and see where women are Muslim women are affected etc and then what happened by this certain uh, then it proceeded then we had the Gujarat riots and Gujarat riots women were so violently mutilated I have a small book on this in fact if I have an article I will email you were sexually mutilated uh, to a scale which you did not think after the partition we would ever experience mm -hmm. again. It was there at the partition and we thought all that is behind us. Mm -hmm. And women were in shelter homes, uh, newspapers were talking about sexual abuse, mm -hmm. we did one study in the shelter homes and they were not at all ready to speak that I was violated. It was always somebody else was violated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know like women came with bleeding vaginal injuries, the men had to help them to take out the splinters that were in their vaginas. Mm. They were pregnant, they gave birth in those, you know, in the heat of Ahmedabad in the month of May, April, May. They were just left open. Hospitals were not catering to them. They were afraid to go to the hospitals, seeing that, you know, that there'll be cases levied against them. The men with injuries, it was so horrible. Mm -hmm. 2002. So after that, many more groups stopped asking for uniform civil code uh, mm -hmm. because the right wing government and all the time when we went there they said oh this is happening to the Hindu side would say this is happening to them because there's no uniform civil code mm -hmm. but the violence happened because there's no uniform civil code you know these Muslims are appeased so we should um, that's why this violence is happening though violence had no relationship to personal laws mm -hmm. and this is one of the questions that was asked me in the law uh, the, the seminar on law that I took mm -hmm. that will it is communal tensions. Mm -hmm. The communal tensions are there on the Mandir issue. Caste and tensions are there of uh, things like manual scavenging. It has nothing to do with the Hindu law is there, Muslim law is there. Uh, issues at the political level have nothing to do with uniform civil code. And yet this bogey gets created. If we have one law, then everything will be fine. Assumption being that Hindus are, have a good law. And Hindu women do not have problem, which is not the case at all. If you see a dowry death, 100% of uh, Hindu women mm -hmm. who killed mm 
Mm-hmm. Or uh, who are subjected to extreme violence. We don't have, I mean, I just stop talking about them. Then what happened more recently, and there's certain uh, Muslim women's group that came up. They did a study about Muslim women's li- lives, and there were like 84 questions there, asking what happens about divorce, about inheritance, about child custody, about illiteracy, about poverty, about marginalization. They released the report after the new government came and at a press conference and they flagged issues of triple talaq and uh, polygamy mm-hmm. which was picked up by the entire media and according to me it sort of matches with the global islamophobia yeah. and it's got a currency you write articles and you know like you one one talaq happens here you go and interview that woman you put her there etc suddenly our supreme court made a reference Constitute a committee because Muslim women have no rights. There is polygamy, there is uh, triple talaq, we need to look at it. So the judgment that came is a very nuanced judgment, it's a long judgment. But it says triple talaq is invalid. My concern here is that we have been taking women to court looking at the judgments that have come across the years and particularly a Supreme Court judgment which came in 2002 which said that um, this is not the way to do the talaq, the talaq is, has to be Quranic. Before that, there is a Supreme Court judgment in 2001 that when a Muslim woman is divorced, she is entitled to a fair and uh, fair and reasonable lump sum settlement. Now these two judgments, one is called Daniel Atifi judgment, one is called Shamimara judgment. Now if you put these judgments together, and the both Supreme Court, Daniel Atifi is a constitutional bench, five judges, and uh, Shami Mara is two judges. 2001 and 2 I am talking about, we are in 2017. And if you put out this information, so many women would have been benefited and have been benefited. Every single high court has held that the procedure for uh, triple talaq has to be followed, which involves a woman, a woman who has gone to court asking for maintenance, husband says I have given a talaq, she's, uh, court say no, this is not the correct procedure. Uh, husband has gone to high court against it and the high court has held this. So many of them, I can give a long list. But that didn't matter at all. It didn't come in the public space. Even Islamic scholars were not aware. But they're scholars, they're not lawyers. They don't go to court, actually. And was, I mean, there were lawyers who was taking them to court, but they were like ordinary lawyers. They don't have a political clout. A very simple thing, but we have done it for so many women. So suddenly when this reference happened, the issue got very polarized and the Supreme Court had to constitute a five judge bench. Now what the Chief Justice did, he himself is a Sardar, a minority, and he constituted five judges after whom only one was Hindu and four were minorities, Christian, Parsi, Muslim, uh, Sardar and a Hindu, five judges. And that only showed his like, his... Um, approach towards multiculturalism against the Uniform Civil Code. So what came finally was a, just the 2001 2000 judgment got appealed here. It didn't do anything new. It did not give any new rights to women, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And the woman would still have to go to court and do exactly what she had to do at 2002. So legal literacy becomes important and uh, lawyers become important. How will she go to court when litigation is so expensive? beyond her reach. She's so scared. So somebody has to guide her. But when the case came up to the Supreme Court, a lot of NGOs working at the local level, whenever a woman said, I've been given talaq, rather than going to the local court and enforcing your rights, they all jumped into this political uh, fray and put their cases in there. So at the end, these women became famous and they said, oh my God, for the first time women has come, women is challenging. You didn't look at all the women who went, challenged and got their rights. Right of maintenance, right, various other rights, custody of children, something else. Uh, women have co- made complaints against their husband for rape, mm-hmm. uh, against the husband, against the father in law. These are the women who are going to court, and yet we think that Muslim women have no rights, Muslim women do not go to court. And this notion, which has a political agenda in the country, but also matches with a global agenda, is so ingrained. That whatever you say counter to it just doesn't hold what. Mm. So I'm now writing a book, putting all my essays to say, okay, now let us see where we're going, you know, why we're saying this. 
but I know it is very difficult today. But what is interesting is that our right wing government gave it a lot of boost. A prime minister talked about it, he cried for Muslim women uh, in this uh, UP campaign for the state election. And then after the election, BJP came with a thumping uh, majority. And they put uh, again extreme right wing uh, organization out which we call RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which and he's a Muslim basho, made prime minister, the prime chief minister, and and the, and the representation of Muslims reduced from seventy five to twenty five. In the same period, twenty fourteen to seventeen, we had things like beef ban. In the state that I am, beef is banned. So many states have banned beef. There is a law against slaughter of animals, which is a, again a Muslim trade. And there have been like lynchings of Muslims, young men, old men, on the mere suspicion uh, uh, they are, they are uh, having beef in their fridge, or they are planning to kill cows, etc., or that they look Muslim. A boy, 16 year old, was killed in the train on the ground. That Oh, he looks Muslim. And nobody came to his help. Mm -hmm. And he was beaten brutally. His brother was beaten and they were thrown out. For 45 minutes they were at the station and then finally he died. This happened parallel. The lynchings happened parallel to the Triple Tala. Mm -hmm. We had this Independence Day where the Prime Minister addresses the nation. And he talked about Muslim women. He did not talk about lynchings at all. So this Muslim women have a problem. Hindu women have a problem, but Muslim women have no rights becomes a political issue. And Muslim women are ident taken out of the community context, but they are still Muslim. They are part of the same community, which is pushed to the background. Uh, the literacy is so low, there is so much marginalization. They are like secluded. Uh, there is no political voice there. Uh, in this entire Uttar Pradesh election, BJP did not field a single Muslim candidate. In the center, in the parliament, we have 4% Muslims today. And the court now said, uh, so the, the, this judgment, which is very well crafted, doesn't go towards UCC. It says that personal laws, religious beliefs are fundamental and we have to protect. Even if you bring a law, this belief has to be protected. That means you're going away from UCC. But the Prime Minister, the uh, UP Chief Minister and everybody else rejoicing, the Supreme Court said enact a uniform civil code. In fact, some newspapers ran a whole series about uniform civil code for and against arguments of bringing uniform civil code on the point. So my concern is that you must give Muslim women the right, you must give Hindu women the right, you must protect the community identity and you have to frame the rights within this debate. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex thing but hope somewhere. I will succeed. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your honesty and your hard work. So I think that'll do it. Thank you.